it would be cool, especially because we know each other still, to do our last match with each other too and have us both bookend our careers. But I keep joking with him. It's like, dude, you have to retire at some point or I'm not <laughs> going to be able to do it. Because Jim Ross pulled me aside one of the first matches he called for me in Smoky Mountain. He says, just so you know, kid, he says, like, unless you actually stop doing something long enough, I can't ever talk about you and put you over. Lance, such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. No, no problem. My pleasure. I think that you're the one wrestler that I've wanted to talk to for the longest, you know, for the longest time. And now we're finally making this happen because we both went to Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Yeah, I, I was only there for a year and a half, but uh, that is uh, my uh, university from way back when. Yeah, I played volleyball there. You you played volleyball at Laurier. Wow. Yes. For people that may have never been to Canada or maybe don't know what we're talking about, the $5 bill has Wilfred Laurier on it. And this is what our uh, university was named after. I, d I didn't know he was on the five. What do you mean you don't? Really? <laughs> Why? I, not something I was aware of. No. Maybe back stay... then I was, but I've been hitting the head a lot. <laughs> <laughs> did you live in residence? I did my first year. Um, do, you, do you remember I, which one? I remember physically, like I could go there and tell you where it was, but I don't remember what it was called. So I stayed in Williston. I don't know if maybe you were in Williston Hall. Sounds familiar. Do you remember any of the other names? Uh, there was Mac and Little House was the all guys one. Uh, Mac, Mac, I don't know, Mac Arthur. I don't know. Williston Probably. seems to be the one I would think. I was top floor. Um, if memory serves, it was a wing to the right and a wing to the left, perhaps I was to the right. I feel like that might've been all of them. I don't know. I don't I, know. I, 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 I have a vision of, and again, it was a very small circle of where I went. Sure. Um, you know, there was the, the athletic complex, my residence, and then again, a couple of buildings for classes and that was it. It looks like you're an athletic complex right now. This is a yes. My, uh, generic gym green screen. No, this is like, you're like the rock with the uh, iron paradise. You know, this is where you live. <laughs> I just need a higher like. angle of my camera so I can look up more. <laughs> it looks real. It kind of looks like you're in the corner of your own beautiful personal gym. Well, most people that do these, they have the camera that can treat any room like a green screen, but it's really fuzzy and crappy around them. Yeah. I actually have a green screen on my wall so that it's green behind me. So it turns up a lot better. So was Laurier only for a year and a half because then pro wrestling became the main focus? Yeah, I was in their advanced business program, uh, playing volleyball for a coach I didn't care for. And by my second year, I wasn't enjoying myself. And it was my grades were getting worse. I was unhappy. And it was my roommate at the time, Bruce McGregor from Ottawa. Uh, I'd love to touch base with him if anybody knows where he is. Um, he was the one that pulled me aside and said, do you think maybe your grades are getting worse because you're trying to force yourself to make the decision you want to anyway? Mm. And I went, you know what? I think you're right. And I went to the administration office, whatever it was, and talked to them about it. They said, if you leave now, your grades are high enough. You're always welcome back. If you stay on the trajectory to direct, ugh, I can't even talk today. You've the, been in the, head, like you the said. path you're on now uh we'll throw you out in less than a year i'm like i will see you later and i withdrew and started looking for a wrestling school so and how did you find a wrestling school in what would that have been 1990 uh it would have been 89, 89. the end of 89 that i started looking my stepdad at the time started making calls and investigating um he talked to the power plant in atlanta he actually got put through to Jack Tunney at WWE, WWF offices in New York, uh, in Toronto and spoke to him. And I found the heart camp in a wrestling magazine. Um, but yeah, Jack Tunney told him that WWF finds all of their talent through amateur wrestling. And I told my stepdad that that was a lie. So he called him back to call him on his lie. Wow. And Jack Tunney told him, sir, to be perfectly honest, I just as soon not bother with you and hung up. Wow. Yes. I think well, I've I told this story once, but yeah. when, when my stepdad told me that story, because I was always a WCW fan more than a WWF fan. 
Yeah. My secret goal in life was to someday be successful enough that I had the chance to go to WCW or WWF. And I was going to tell WWF, thank you, sir, but I just as soon not bother and go to WCW. <laughs> <laughs> Quick time out from this conversation and a big thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this one. When you're traveling or just anytime you log on to public Wi-Fi, that is a hotbed for hackers to jump in there and snatch up your information. NordVPN keeps you protected and I love that it's so easy to set up. You can do it on your phone, a tablet or your laptop. The best part though is being able to access content from 59 different countries just by changing your virtual location with one click. So yes, that means you can access the WWE Network again in places like here in the US where the WWE Network is not a thing anymore and it's on Peacock. It also means you can get UFC pay-per-views for like a sixth of the cost just by changing your virtual location, boom, with one click. To grab your huge discount off your NordVPN plan, go to NordVPN com slash CVV and you can get up to four months for free. Plus, there's no risk here with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's NordVPN.com slash CVV. This is a limited time offer though, so grab it now before it's gone. The thing that I love about this story and what's so interesting is you wanted it so bad that you were going to find a wrestling school no matter what. And there's so many people right now that want to be pro wrestlers. They say it's their dream to be a pro wrestler. You can literally get on your phone and find the nearest wrestling school or the best wrestling school in your area. And they still don't do anything about it. There is, although with that, and this is where I think I differ from a lot of people. I gave myself a five-year window. Mm. Like I told myself that if I'm not making progress where it seems like this is a viable career, I'm going to go back to university. I'm not going to be just some guy chasing some silly dream. I think I might enjoy this job. I think I can make a living at it. Let's see if I have an aptitude for it. Mm. And it was funny. Um, a friend of mine's dad, uh, Steve Benning, if he ever happens to listen to this, everyone I knew was supportive. Everybody was like, yeah, go for it, go for it, go for it. And he was the only one. He pulled me aside and just said, whatever you do, just don't become a bum. And it meant a lot to me. It's like, hey, chase your dream, but don't chase it down a garbage dump. Yeah, yeah. You can't always, you know, maybe this isn't as inspirational as it should be, but you can't always succeed at your dreams. You have to be realistic. Mm. So I set the goal that if I wasn't making progress, if it didn't seem like I had a real chance of success at this, I was going to go back to school and I was making my living in three. Wow. I did the exact opposite of you. So I went, I started training as a pro wrestler between my second and third year uh, of university. I was in Toronto and then it, it was summertime. So then when school came back around that September, I was at like a fork in the road and I'm like, all right, do I focus on wrestling school and giving my all to that? Or do I focus on school school and giving my all to that? And I made the opposite decision and went, I'm going to go back to school school because wrestling will always be there. I can, you know, dip my toe into that later on in life. What year was this? 2002. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's. 2003, sorry, 2003. Three. And I was going to the squared circle in Toronto. I'm sure you're familiar with okay, it. Okay, yep. But, but yeah, that's, I, that's a tough time because that's basically just WWF. TNA had just started, but it was like, seemed like a lot. And indies hadn't exploded and taken off yet either. So it, uh, I could see it being a daunting business of there's WWF and no steps in between. Yeah, and the internet wasn't, nearly what it is now so like how are you going to make a name for yourself when youtube doesn't even exist when social media is not even a thing tell me about it i broke in in 1990 well and that's the thing right you broke into this like when very few canadians were breaking in like you you were a, a really a pioneer during that time well there would have been those who because stampede just ended before i broke in so there still would have been canadians getting in that way and stampede was just alive still um, it was still on TSN playing national in Canada when I signed up for the Hart Brothers Pro Wrestling Camp. Do you remember your first? And it it oh, shut down like a month after I sent my money in and signed <laughs> up. And I was just like, oh, no, there's no more wrestling. 
but the guy who was running the heart camp for Keith said that no, a new promotion is starting up. It'll be bigger and better. And I'm like, yeah, sure it will be. But it did in fact, uh, CNWA, I believe the name was, did fill the TSN time slot. So I saw, okay, there is a promotion. So I figured it's like, well, I can at least get work when I get out there. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember the first time that you met Chris Jericho and what your impressions were of him when you met him? Yeah, I do. Um, we we all stayed at a hotel. Well, there was two people from Calgary who lived in Calgary, but we all stayed in a hotel in Okotoks, Alberta, which is, you know, it's a, basically a bedroom community now. And it was this crappy hotel. And I got picked up at the airport and taken to this hotel. And every person I see when I get there is skinny little kid, big fat guy, like no one looked like an athlete at all. And I had no, again, you didn't have internet. So you didn't know that that's what all wrestling schools look like. Right. I was, you know, and I trained, I was in good shape. It's like, I'm expecting to show up at like an NFL camp, right. Where I'm like praying to God, I'm in good enough shape to hang. Yeah. And then I see this and because my stepdad had looked into the power plant and looked into, uh, the Hart brothers, I chose Hart brothers because Stampede had a rep for smaller guys and staying in Canada made it easier. But I had went to the end of the hallway. There was a fire escape and I'm standing on the fire escape. And in my mind, I'm thinking I've made a huge mistake. This place is a joke. Yeah. So I'm in my mind going, can I change my flight? Can I, you know, I'll call my stepdad. I'll see if he can get me into the power plant. I need to get the hell out of here. And then this green beat up looking 76 Volare pulls into the parking lot and out jumps Chris Jericho. And I see a kid that clearly goes to the gym that clearly looks like an athlete. And I'm like running down the fire escape to meet this person because maybe there's, if there's someone else here that has a hope in hell, then maybe I didn't make a mistake. So I ran down and introduced myself to Chris and helped him carry his trunk of clothes and stuff out of the trunk of his car and helped him move in. And it's like, if, if not for seeing him, I probably would have been on a plane back home the next day. Wow. I, I'm just so fascinated in life by these moments that change your life, you know, for better or for worse. Like, could you imagine if Chris Jericho could have gone to wrestling school a year before or a year later and this meeting never would have happened? Yeah. And Chris and I have talked about it because unless we both ended up going to a different school, but assuming I stayed and he wasn't there or he stayed and I wasn't there, there was quite literally no one else to work with. Like we would have been doomed because we did everything with each other and train. Like we were, you know, we were at the top of the class and it was a big gap to who was next. And without each other, it's like we would have, I don't know what we would have done. I, I can't imagine we would have progressed anywhere near where we were. So if you're born in Ontario, you're going to college, university in Ontario, is that what brought you out west to Alberta was wrestling? Yes. Yes. I packed everything that I needed that I owned in a large duffel bag and got on the first commercial flight I'd ever taken and uh, flew to Calgary and got picked up at the airport by... Ed Langley and Brad Young. Ed was the guy that ran the camp for Keith. And Brad was a grad from a previous year that did all the instructing. That was sort of the gimmick to the Hart Brothers camp. Ed ran it. Keith took the money and a graduate from a previous year taught the class. Wow. Um, I, I taught it in 91 and 92 after graduating in 90. Wow. And you've lived in Calgary ever since? I lived in uh, Tennessee for... 10 months during my Smoky Mountain run. And I lived in uh, Cape Coral, Florida for a year during my ECW tenure. But other than that, yeah, it's been Calgary. Wow. It's amazing. And, and also Chris Jericho is still wrestling now 30 plus years later. Yes. That's, uh, <laughs> that's sort of the, 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 the running joke between us because we've, over the years have made a pact that because our very first match was against each other. We did yeah. like a 10 or a 15 minute draw. I don't remember which uh, in Pinoca, Alberta out here. And I've always contended that it would be cool, especially because we know each other still to do our last match with each other too, and have us both bookend our careers. 
And on one of the Talk is Jericho podcasts, as well as recently, just personally, we've sort of, you know, um, what's the word, reaffirmed the pact to do it. But I keep joking with him. It's like, dude, you have to retire at some point or I'm not <laughs> going to be able to do it. You know, you, you've got to retire inside the next five or 10 years, dude, or I'm not going to be, I don't want to do it at 75. <laughs> yeah. How much longer could Jericho go? The man's indestructible. Yeah. He really is. Like he's had so few serious injuries and he just seems to keep on going. Like he, he had the broken arm in 94 in Smoky Mountain, which never hurt. Like he was never in pain ever from it and had to take some time off because they had surgery, but it still wasn't hurt. And again, I th um, he did talk about that he did his first, I think it was his first hiatus from WWE. His back was bothering him and it was bad, but DDP yoga fixed him up and he's never had a problem with it since. I believe he did tear an ACL way back, but was told by doctors, you're one of the few people that still has a fairly stable knee and just never had anything done about it. And he wears a neoprene on his knee and is fine. The dude's indestructible. It's, it's insane. And it's not like he's taking it easy. Like he's still a rock star on tour. He's still running the Jericho cruise. He still has the podcast, one of the top wrestling podcasts in the world. And he's wrestling all the time with AEW. Oh, it is. I I don't remember when it was, but it was a while back. He was in like a six man with either inner circle or, you know, his appreciation society. But it was like a six man. Yeah. And it was like, he's the workhorse out there doing all the work. And I remember texting him going, uh, dude, you realize you're the big name now. You don't have to do that. And he's like, that's just me, man. You know, and I'm like, yeah, I know I'm the same way, but it's, uh, it's who he is. Wow. So my first introduction to you, I was obviously aware of ECW, but as you know, it wasn't airing in Canada until like, I think it was 99 when it was on the new TNN. And I saw you for the first time and I went, Lance Storm, that's my guy. But I also was thrown off because I'm like, you and Just Incredible seemed like polar opposites, but you worked so well together. And I'm just curious, what, who, what, was, what did Paul Heyman see in you guys to make you a tag team? Um, it wasn't Paul. The I mentioned earlier that I had taught the heart camp in 91 and 92. Well, Just Incredible was one of my students in 1992. Wow. So I trained and taught PJ how to work. So when I got to ECW and he got there, we kept bugging Paul. Can we have a match? Can we have a match? Because we wanted to work with each other. Yeah. We had wrestled once you know, I, one of his early matches, his last one bef at, before he left Calgary to move back to the States, we had wrestled once, but we wanted to work. So after hounding Paul forever, um, we were both heels. So eventually there was a three-way dance with Dreamer where he put us both together with Dreamer. And since we were heels working Tommy, we kind of teamed up and beat him up a little bit. And I think Paul saw it then that we could go together. And you know, you mentioned we were polar opposites. I think that's why we worked mm. in that ECW had two real elements. Well, three, if you count the crazy women and the cat fights, but from a men's wrestling standpoint, there was the hardcore stuff, you know, the balls, Mahoney, the Sandmans, the Sabus, the just incredibles. He's got the stick, he's got the jeans and he's not your traditional wrestler, but ECW also had the Shane Douglases, the Dean Malenko's, the Chris Candidos, the, I'd like to say the Lance Storms, the wrestlers that did, you know, the Dean and Eddie's and the, all the wrestling stuff. So I was the professional wrestler side of ECW and Justin was the hardcore side of ECW. So together we covered those bases and then you moved Don Marie into the mix and like we really covered all three elements of ECW pro wrestling. And I think that's why we worked. I think that you guys were instrumental in making Calgary, Alberta, Canada, like something that wrestling fans would know. I don't think any Americans would ever have any idea what Calgary even was, let alone where it was on a map. I, I laugh because that does seem to be so many people now say it that way as the way you're supposed to say it. And I will forever hear from people where it's you know they're flying in from somewhere it's like we're about to a land land in calgary alberta canada and they're like they say it just like lance does and it just became the my gimmick if you will 
And it was just the naturally the way I said it, but the dramatic pause uh, became a thing. And uh, yeah, just sort of stood there. And that too was Paul wanted me basically doing the Bret Hart deal that Brett was doing in WWF before that Canada versus the U S yeah. And I didn't want to do the exact same thing as Canada versus the U S. So I decided to just pick the city. I'm from here. It's the wrestling capital of the world. I'm just pro uh, Calgary. This Mm. isn't a nationality thing. I'm not out here waving a flag. I just think my hometown's better than every other place. It's, you know, the grassroots of pro wrestling. And because of that, I'm better than everyone. And just to make it my own and not have Paul realize I'm not doing what I'm told. I went just with Calgary. It's just such an interesting thing to like repeat the name of your hometown in every promo that you cut. I don't know if that had ever been done before that point. I I have no idea. Like people, you know, would do it as a cheap pop when they're in that town. Sure. And, you know, I think, you know, punk has certainly made Chicago his thing, but it's not like he name drops it everywhere he goes. And there's an interesting thing that happens in wrestling. And as a Canadian myself, I was always hyper aware of this, but like Canadians were just instant heels. It was like, and and you didn't even have to say like, we think we're better than you because we're from Canada and you're from the stinky US. It's just like, no, we're from Canada. That's all you'd have to say. And it was immediately, boo. And I, I just never understood it. Well, I think, and only in the US. And that's something that, you know, WWE, FWWE, whichever you want to use, um, never understood. But it's all about America is always America is the greatest place in the world. And, you know, if you've actually been anywhere else, it's not necessarily the truth. And I think any foreign foreign person who touts their country as being good gets heat in the u.s Mm. and i say how wwf doesn't realize it i guess i should just use wwe and get get used to it but that like they assumed the un-americans would be heels everywhere yeah and i'm like no we're gonna be baby faces everywhere but the u.s you don't get this Mm. and they didn't understand that my pro calgary thing would be a baby face in other parts of Canada. They're like, well, you're not from New Brunswick. Why would they like you here? It's like, because yeah. Canada's the world's biggest small town. Mm. It's like, if you're a Canadian that made it on the international scene, you're our hometown boy. Doesn't matter if you're from Victoria, you know, Moose Jaw, New Brunswick, Ottawa. If you're a Canadian that made it internationally, you're our hometown boy. You just are. We'll buy you a Tim's. That's the way it goes. <laughs> There's this funny thing. I live in Los Angeles now. So there's this funny thing when you run into another actor or person that's from Canada, you're like, oh, one of us. And then you start listing off like also Ryan Reynolds and Nickelback and Justin Bieber and Alanis Morissette and Alex Trebek. And you just keep listing them off. You're like, one of us, one of us. It just, it, it that just happens to be a and thing. And it's incredible of how many of us there are. Absolutely. And in pro wrestling too. Like, I think there's so many wrestlers that have you know are from canada and maybe don't tout it as much like it's not part of their gimmick but you can look back and go oh yeah val venus wow that's a canadian yep i i think uh evil uno of the dark order is canadian um i think daddy magic is too i could be wrong about that but there's there's lots of them but Although uh, there was that interesting thing that happened after 9-11 where all of the babyface pro wrestlers in WWE were no longer from uh, Edmonton, Alberta, like Chris Benoit or Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba, like Chris Jericho was now residing in Tampa, Florida. Well, that was primarily, again, I will say my fault, but <laughs> that, well, it started when the Un-Americans became a thing which mm-hmm. would have been 2002 actually no yeah. a little bit before that because we were already the un-americans at the anniversary of 9-11 so it was just not long after 9-11 that we were doing the un-americans and the office figured that the wrestling fans were too dumb to tell the difference between test christian and lance storm who are canadians and hate the u.s and Chris Jericho and Edge, who are Canadians that don't hate America. (laughs) 
So they actually Edge was the only one I don't think they changed, but Jericho was using his birthplace of Manhasset, New York, and Benoit was from Ed uh, from Atlanta, and they were they it just Vince didn't think people could tell the difference and thought that well all Canadians will be heels now because um, Test Christian and Lance Storm are evil people from Canada. Uh, we're jumping all around here a little bit. I want to get back to ECW for a minute. Do you think you ever had any? run there or any storyline that was leading towards you becoming the world champion in ECW? I don't think there, there ever was because my leaving happened so abruptly that, mm -hmm. you know, we were, you know, Paul had his top guys contended and who they were. And it really wasn't until Mike awesome jump ship that there was a bit of a panic of, Oh crap, what do we do now? Yeah. But by that time he didn't have me, locked up secure um timeline wise uh i was world tag champs at the time with pj so it was really a case of it was never time you know we were being used and being functional where we were while he had bigger plans already for his world title and then by the time he had to start looking for okay taz is gone awesome's gone where do i put my world title he was trying to secure, secure everyone with their contracts and I wasn't as secure as others. Mm. And there was that point. And oddly enough, it was, God, was it the same night? I think it was, we did. Um, I got hurt. Thankfully it just ended up being a stinger, but I took a kendo stick shot to C one and just had a little bit of tingling in my fingers on a run in. Um, mm. It was before the match. We were supposed to do a six man in the main. Um, so I ended up getting backboarded and was going to be taken to the hospital. And I believe that was the night he had PJ throw down the world tag team titles. And I think won the world title, maybe he, but it was, it was all around the same time frame. And I think it was the case of, he realized I'm probably gone soon having Justin turn heel and throw the belts down and ditch me, so to speak, took care of that thing. And then with PJ being more locked up and, and Paul figured he would stay, he went with Justin. And that's why my last match was challenging Justin for the title and leaving Yeah, because I wasn't uh, locked into ECW because I knew they had financial issues. You ended up having a ton of success in WCW, but I, I, I talked to Vince Russo about this. I feel like they ruined Mike Awesome there. Uh, they did, yes. I mean, uh, what, what, what the heck was that gimmick? Which one? Oh, I, I, would, I was referring to that, that 70s guy. Oh, because the, uh, the fat chick thriller was not all that in a bag of chips either. But I assume because when he jumped, he was the career killer and started, you know, I think he, you know, attacked Kevin Nash and was like in the mix. And he was immediately downgraded hmm. his career killer and fat chick thriller. And I assumed it was just a political move by people with power, whether, and that's one thing that everyone booking WCW to a certain extent does have, I don't know if a get out of jail free card is right, but the built in excuse of too many people had creative control. You are limited to what you can do. You know, you can have a good idea if three people on top go, no, I don't have to do that. It's in my contract. It's like, what do you do? Yeah. But, you know, he was quickly sabotaged to the fat chick thriller. And then what really annoyed me was the New Blood Rising show where it was Mike and I in the pay-per-view where Brett came out. They could have really cemented me as a top guy, especially in Canada. But they did the absurd finish where Mike beat me like six times in the match, and then I squeak it out on a ridiculous technicality. And they made him that 70s guy a week and a half later. And I'm like, if you knew you were going to make him a comedy joke in a week, why didn't I just beat him clean? Mm. And, you know, and, I, and I've both Mike and I were so annoyed when they pitched the finish to us because we just wanted to have a good match. We were buddies. We'd worked every place. We always had good chemistry. And it's like, you know, I've thought about it afterwards. It's like with where he was going, if they knew, they may have decided three days later that they were going to make him that 70s guy. But had I 
put him in the half crab at some point for a good near fall. He escapes. I eventually put him in the sharpshooter and win. Tap him clean in the middle of the ring. Yeah. Then when you hit Brett's music, you can have the announcers put over. It's like Lance stole Brett's move. Mm. Is Brett coming out with, you know, hold on, kid, gimmick infringement, brother. And he gets in the ring. We have that moment where we look at each other. We hug and Mark Madden hits the line. It's like, well, who do you think taught him the hold? He's from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And I get Brett's endorsement and I now use the sharpshooter. Mm. I'd have been a god in Canada from a wrestling standpoint. I was pretty over as it was in Canada with three belts with flags on them. <laughs> but it would have been such a stronger thing to do. And it wouldn't have changed Mike's projection moving forward because he's that 70s guy in a week in the lava lamp lounge in a stupid leisure suit yeah do you remember the first time that you met bret hart uh it was new blood rising it was that night that was that night yeah he and and ironically i don't know if it's ironic right, but it was funny in that he pulled me aside before the match and he said you know I don't know how to put this. I just want to be nice, but it's like, I just hope you realize there's a good chance the crowd could turn on you tonight with this finish. Mm. And I said to him, I said, well, I think that's why you're here. And he looked at me. I'm like, I think they figure no matter how bad they crap on me in this booking, if you come out and raise my hand in the end, it all will be forgiven. Mm. And he's like, you're probably right. <laughs> but thankfully the fans didn't turn on me, but you know, I got pinned for a three count and restarted it. I tapped out and they restarted it. I got pinned for a five count. They restarted it. And then Jacques Rougeau knocks him out with brass knucks and I win because he helps me to my feet. It's like, you could not have booked me weaker in a city that I went in as a bloody hero. Yeah. And if it was anything other than a Canadian in Canada, they would have turned on me. Yeah. I mean, when you think of Calgary, Alberta, Canada, I think there's two wrestlers that immediately pop into your head and it's Bret Hart and it's Lance Storm. Yeah. And, and weirdly enough, I'm amazed that that is the case because again, when I was a fan and broke in Bret Hart, Calgary, the hearts, the hearts, the hearts, Calgary, 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 the fact that people remember me when they say the city is a, a real um, accomplishment, a, a point of pride of mine that I actually managed to squeeze myself into the uh, crowded wrestling history of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. But look, this is the great thing about wrestling is if you say something enough, if you repeat it enough, that's the thing that wrestling fans will always remember. It, it really is. It's well, that's Vince McMahon, right? You brand it enough. If you tell people the name long enough, uh, people will uh, sink into it. Yeah. Although I would I imagine mean, my, 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 my hometown, in Ontario probably feels left out. <laughs> but along those same lines, like Lance Storm and the word serious, you know, they're linked together for the rest of your life too. Yes. And and thankfully there's still a few people. Nigel McGuinness uh, manages to keep me alive. Uh, there was a collision. I think it was MJF put someone in a half crab and he actually said, uh, the champ is getting, uh, getting serious for a minute. And, and put over uh, that the hold was mine. And that's another thing that I'm, I'm really surprised and pleased about in that I remember when I broke in, I was a huge Bobby Eaton fan. And I thought it was really cool that if anyone ever did a leg drop off the top rope, they thought of Bobby Eaton. Mm. And I thought it'd be really cool if there was a wrestling move that if anyone in the world ever did it, wrestling fans thought of you. Mm. And as a young former volleyball player that's jumping and flipping and trying to get over with crazy stupid moves i never in a million years thought a half boston crab would be it but it seems that whenever anyone does a half boston crab especially if they do the 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 back roll into it everyone thinks of me so uh that's another thing that's just insane and i've talked to jericho about it it's like when we broke in in Calgary, we're all trying to do springboards and flips and all these moves. And it's like, who would have thought both of us ended up with a Boston crab finisher? But look, it's the move that every little kid can put on their little brother. I'm not sure that's a good thing. <laughs> How does, if I could be serious for a minute, become a catchphrase? 
Um, I think like many in that it was just one line in one promo that when I said it, the everyone just sort of thought it fit. Mm. Like, I don't remember who wrote it, but because in WCW, I would always be given the page of the booking sheet with what I was doing. And they would have a promo written out with what you're supposed to say. I would always rewrite it into my own words because I think the very first promo I did in WCW, I did it verbatim and it wasn't in my words. And I botched a couple of the words because it just, the sentences were the wrong length. It wasn't how I spoke. So I always rewrote my promos. I keep much of it the same, but I would rewrite them my own way. But I do remember the, but if I can be serious for a moment, that was written in there because it was when I won the U S title I'm a heel, but I start putting over all the other great U S champions. And then I do the, but if I can be serious for a minute, I deserve much better. And then I denounce the U S title and, you know, name it the Canadian title. And when I came back, one of the writers or the agent, I don't recall who it was. Someone just went, you have to say that in every promo now. It's like, it just, it's you. I'm like, okay. And then I said it in virtually every promo for the rest of my career. And it wasn't, you, 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 you did it. You did the point with two fingers. I'm trying to, I, uh, there's my camera. There it is. I didn't know I did that <laughs> until uh, they did the Bill DeMott and the Misfits in Action did the spoof promo where they dressed up like us, which is a, a very Russo uh, trait it was done really well with either dx or the nation or whoever it was the first time and then everybody did it whether it was any good or not but they did that and bill demott did the promo and he when he pointed at the camera with two fingers i'm like why is he pointing with two fingers and when he came back i even asked him i'm like that looks ridiculous why did you do that and he's like that's what you do i'm like really <laughs> did they ever uh, at any point say you have a canadian accent and we need you to have less of a Canadian accent? No. No one has ever said that or accused me of having a Canadian accent. I suppose I do to an extent, but... I mean, uh, it plays into your character as well, right? Well, it's it's who I am. So, But yeah, the only time I've ever had anyone tell me to talk differently was, you know, that first year or so in WWF where they were telling me to cut monotonous flat monotone promos they told and it was just their take on if i can be serious for a minute was this man shows no emotion mm. and they told me outright uh it was brian gewertz that said you know our vision for you is sam the eagle from the muppets I'm just, <laughs> oh great so they would make me do backstage segments and promos. Like I'd have to do three or four takes and tell them, you know, where they tell me, no, flatter, flatter, flatter. I'm like, okay. And then after about three months, Jericho pulls me aside and he says, uh, just so you know, they bury you in production meetings for having flat robotic promos. I'm like, oh, great. Cause they're making me do them that way. And then throwing me under the bus. And I guess whoever was, telling me to make them flatter didn't want to jump up and go oh sorry i was making him do that and just let me get buried in production meetings for being a flat promo wow and i think there's a lot of people that still to this day think that you are boring and monotonous and you speak like that all the time well like we said earlier you tell people something long enough that yeah. is a fact and the the boring angle that we did for about a year maybe less um, yeah, that people have just decided that that's who I am. And it's like, well, if you go back and watch any other part of my career, I had emotion and personality and, uh, so be it. <laughs> you had an interesting stretch of your career there where you worked for ECW, WCW and WWE all within, I believe it was less than two years. So if we were to look back at this, what's kind of the the main memory or like what's what of, of like the way that things are in each company let's backstage ecw wcw and wwe what's the main like idea that sticks out for all three of those i think the the biggest thing from a career standpoint for me like ecw is where i found myself as a performer 
like before ECW, I was Lance Evers, really good athlete, professional wrestler using a pseudonym. In ECW, I found who Lance Storm was and became an actual living, breathing pro wrestler where there was a definite feel and identity of, of his own personality outside of Lance Evers. So I became a true performer, pro wrestler in ECW. I think WCW was where I proved that I could main event on a big stage. <clears throat> and then WC WWF was just sort of, okay, I'm on the biggest stage. And I, I think that's where I really had the chance to, and again, Chris Jericho can attest to this. My goal, even from wrestling camp was never to be world champion. It was to be respected as a, by my peers as a good worker. And I think WWF was really where the top level performers of the industry worked with me most. And I earned that respect. So I think that was sort of the, the, the cherry on top of the Sunday, really, even mm -hmm. though I, those will say I didn't have as much success in WWF, but I did have several world tag team runs as well as an IC title run and got to work with, you know, rock and Hogan. So it's not like I was uh, completely wasted. It wasn't all just dancing and having a large penis. <laughs> I feel like WCW guys just weren't given the respect in WWF that they should have gotten. There was all, there's a ton of examples of that. And I just feel like there's guys, I talked to DDP recently and it's just like, look what they did to a guy like that. And I feel like there's a lot of examples of that. Well, I, I think in wrestling and this, this, you always have to fit in and adapt mm. and not everyone can do that. And, and that's something that, again, you know, I, I attest Jericho and guys that broke in, 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 in our era, like Jericho went to Mexico and got over. He went to Japan and got over. He went to ECW and got over. He went to WCW and got over because he could adapt WWF, AEW, New mm -hmm. Japan. And then there are those that succeed in a certain environment. And they may not be able to adapt. And when they go somewhere else, they want to succeed in under the exact same situation they got to succeed in the last place. And that's not always the case. And that's where versatility really helps. And there was a lot of people that succeeded greatly in ECW but didn't thrive elsewhere. There was people that thrived in WCW. Now there was a lot of politics keeping a lot of people, you know, from succeeding when they went to WWF. And I think I was very fortunate in that, that I think I was far enough down the main event pecking order of the WCW guys that I was low on the radar of guys that needed to be kneecapped when they came in but I was high enough up that I wasn't just a guy they're going to send to developmental and put in the cruiserweight division. So I was sort of, I think I benefited on that. And then also too, I'm a very versatile guy that can make others look good and, and quickly get the, the respect and the desire of others to want to work with me. Cause wow, he'll really make me look good. And that too is, you know, there's stars and there's star makers and I don't make any bones about it. I'm more a star maker than a star, but if you're a star, then you require star makers. And when you're an outsider being brought in, the home team doesn't want to be the star maker to your star. Mm. And that's when politics gets in the way. Mm. And if you don't, adapt and fit into the model that's there for you to fit into it makes it easy for people to dismiss the abilities you do have mm. speaking of abilities i think that nobody has a more textbook super kick than lance storm and it's funny it was not something i ever planned or wanted to do Wow. I I think I could be wrong, but in my memory, the first one I ever threw was just because Jimmy Del Rey called one on the fly in Smoky Mountain. He sent me off the ropes and said, leapfrog me, hit me with a super kick. I'm like, okay. And I and just the 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 footwork of leapfrogging him is why I throw it with my left foot, not my right. 
that is just as I land and turn, that was the leg that was facing him. That's the one I threw at him. And then when he called it again the next night, I'm like, oh, shit, I should probably figure out how to do this damn thing and started working on it. Now, it's possible my memory is not accurate and I threw one before then, but it's just the way. And, and it, it ended up being, you know, uh, again, really good for me. And I got quite good at it. I, I think. Because I know other people don't, but I always practice mine on a brick wall. Wow. Because if you stiff the guy, you knock yourself over. Yeah. So you have to be pretty much perfect. Mm. Because either you don't touch the wall or you hit it too hard and you fall over because you're standing on one foot. Mm. And so I always, whether, you know, sometimes it's a metal fire door or something, but I always would stretch and warm up and I'd pick a spot on the wall. And if I could tap it with my toe, then I knew I was light. And when I had, I like, I lunge in with my whole body and there's that big throwing of the hip. So it's like, there's a lot of appearance of oomph behind it, but I don't extend with the knee and actually kick. And I got really good. Cause that's one thing that I always, I appreciate when people say I had one of the better looking super kicks, cause it's like, I touch you, but I don't touch you. You know, I've, many- had, I've had countless people pull me aside afterwards and apologize for putting a hand up and swear they never will again. I had a student. It was, it was funny. We were doing camp because I wrestled with all my students when I ran my school. Yeah. And we used a super kick as the finish. So I hit him with the super kick and hit him. They were watching the match back. And the kick looked great. Kid took a really nice bump. But when he watched it back and saw how good it looked, he just, his mouth fell open. He's like, how i'm like what do you mean he's like i didn't feel it how i'm like well i'm pretty good at this one (laughs) you know how many up-and-coming wrestlers are going to be kicking brick walls or doors like from this point on after hearing this story if it makes their kicks safer i'm all for it (laughs) a lot of people point to the era that you were in your prime you know late 90s early 2000s as you know the heyday the, the best era of pro wrestling wrestling the last let's say two, three, four years has definitely been having a resurgence. And I think that this may be an era that we look back on in 20 years and go, man, things are pretty good right now. What do you think it is right now that is causing this resurgence in pro wrestling? I think the biggest thing is AEW. That the late 90s to the early 2000s was when we had, well, we had WWF, we had WCW, we had ECW, we had you know, two giant players and a pretty solid player as well. So there was a lot of places to work, a lot of people wanting to get into the business, a lot of options. And then when both ECW and WCW shut down, it just sort of, oh, there's just one. And there was less excitement when there was just one. And when AEW formed, it was just like, holy cow, you know, there's another player on the field and i think it really stirred up and it also helps that indies had really started building up bigger and bigger and impact has been there the bridge from when wcw shut down into uh until today but it other than a very very brief period of time never really had that giant feel and i just think aew has built that competitiveness that in some ways totally doesn't help, but in other ways it totally does. And it just, people like to have a side to root for. I think that's why people pick their, their home team in basketball, football, or whatever. And with wrestling now they can pick a home team and root against another team. And it just, and it creates a a bit more buzz. And obviously the ability for people to make bigger and bigger money really helps. You were working backstage as a producer in WWE, and now you're working backstage as a producer in Impact. So, you know, you're you're in there, you're seeing it. And I'm curious if there's anything that is missing from this era of wrestling that you guys did have 20 years ago. There is, but I don't think it can be brought back. But, and I only had a few times, but when fans, the majority of them, or even just a large percentage of them, truly believe and care 
it is like nothing else mm. back you know we go back into kayfabe if you will like smoky mountain those people if you came out of the baby face locker room they loved you and if you came out of the heel locker room they genuinely hated you yeah and they cared whether you win or lost they weren't out to see how many stars you'd get which moves you'd pull off they were genuinely hoping you would win and I, again, I did a tour of Lebanon early on and those fans 100% believed it. Um, the, you know, there was a gun pulled at one point in time. <laughs> what? Yeah. So, and, and, you know, Europe, uh, when I worked there, they genuinely believed it and cared when you won and the emotion you get. And if you've ever seen, you know, world-class footage, Von Eric's Freebirds, it's like, there's a level of emotion and true excitement when fans believe that is just different. Mm. And I don't think you can necessarily ever get that back, but it's different. And I've worked both. It's so much better that just when they live and breathe by what's going on, it's just, it's, you can't really talk about it. It's just different. And it's just, it, it's gone. And again, it's not anyone's fault. You know, there's the internet, there's the availability information. Like, I didn't even know the Wrestling Observer existed when I broke in. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? There was yeah. still many people who thought wrestling was real. And there was, or at least had that doubt, because the number of people who asked me to confirm finally once and for all, it's fake, right? And they wanted someone on the inside to confirm it for them. Yeah. That little ounce of doubt makes a big difference. Mm. I've seen you make some tweets about it. And since you mentioned the Wrestling Observer and five-star matches, where do you sit? Where do you sit on match ratings? Um, I think for the most part, they're asininely stupid. Well, it's just someone's opinion, like, you know, a Siskel and Ebert giving it two thumbs up. It's like, oh, great. Yeah. And I think when it started, it was very valuable because it started during the tape trading era. And if you're old enough to be part of the tape trading era, it's like you would get lists of tapes that someone had in the mail where you actually went to the post office, picked up your letter and opened it up. And there would be a printed photocopy sheet of all the tapes the dude had. And if you're ordering three tapes of all Japan pro wrestling, which tapes do you buy? Hmm. Well, if you have access to the observer, you can go look up the shows and you can find out, Oh shit, this show had, you know, really highly rated matches it's probably good so it's like a movie critic what movie you want to see well what are the critics saying is a good movie i'll go watch yeah. that yeah. so it would help you but i just find it insanely ridiculous that someone would watch the movie and then want to know what someone else thought about it and determine their enjoyment based on the like you've seen the movie did you like it if you did it's great if you didn't, it wasn't. And going back and comparing, like, I'll go watch this match. Man, I think that was three and a quarter. I'm going to go see if I'm right. Yeah. Like, what do you mean if you're right? It's like, that's just his opinion. Who's to say either one of you are right? Yeah, like it's, I, got it's, into, I got into quite the discussion with Dave uh, Meltzer about this. And I guess for me, it just comes down to if, we're going to use movies as an analogy here. If you're constantly saying Quentin Tarantino movies are awesome and you're saying, yeah, Christopher Nolan movies are just okay all the time, I guess people sometimes go, well, actually, some of these are pretty good. Maybe you should give them another look. Why? <laughs> he likes, he, but he likes Tarantino movies. Yeah, so. you're right. He likes New Japan. I mean, that's really, really that's, comes down to it. But Go good for him. Everybody has their tastes. It's like if you asked, you know, yourself, you know, someone asked you, hey, rate these 10 albums and they give you a hip hop album, a country album and a pop album, or whatever kind of music there is, a, a reggae album and a bluegrass album. It's like you're going to like certain ones. Yeah. Well, if you give them to Jim Cornette, he's probably going to like different ones. Yeah. Doesn't mean anybody's wrong. Yeah. It's just, you don't like bluegrass. Maybe Jim Cornette does. Yeah. And arguing over a number, like what? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's also because I'm old, but when I broke in, 
the goal was never ever have the best match possible. Hmm. The goal was hook the people with as little physical effort as possible. Hmm. Cause the goal was that was a night off, but we had them hmm. and you worked as hard as you needed to, to get the crowd. Hmm. And it was a common saying and any person probably my age or older has said it where there's that moment in the match where you just under your breath to your partner, we got them. And you just know they're hooked. We've emotionally hooked the people. And it's like, then you do your match and you leave and you're happy. Mm. And if it was a night off and you didn't have to kill yourself, it was even better. And it used to be a common expression in the business. Oh, that guy's a night off because you know, you could hook the people without any effort. Yeah. And we used to joke about it, but there was contests of, how long you could go in your match before you actually touched. Mm. And it was just playing the crowd with cheap heat, but you had to entertain the crowd the whole time. So having a quote unquote five-star match, it was never a goal. It was never talked about. It was never considered. It was, did you hook the people? Yep. Mm. Anybody get hurt? Nope. Mm. Job done. And that's why I I laugh about, oh, more people are getting five-star matches. Like, well, you know, that was never Jim Duggan's goal ever in his life. Right. His goal was to get over and hook the people. So it's like, is Kenny Omega a better wrestler than Jim Duggan? It's like, well, technically everyone's going to say yes, but it's like Jim Duggan's job was to get over. Mm. And if you go back and watch UWF and early WWF, dude got over mission accomplished and it's just it's just a different industry and now there's a whole generation of wrestlers that are going well how many stars did my match get yeah and it's like i can honestly say never in my career once ever did i look check or find out <laughs> i did it was a year or so ago um me and, and a, a friend of mine online the topic of ratings came up and there was a match that neither one of us liked particularly much and dave gave it some kind of number three and three quarters four whatever it was yeah and we started talking and i'm like i wonder if dave's ever rated anything i've ever done that highly and we went back and looked up like anarchy rules from ecw that a lot of people today still talk about you know my SummerSlam match with edge a few of my what you would consider my better matches yeah and they all were like three and a quarter or something wow and there was a and whatever match it was that we were talking about it's like i guarantee in a week no one will remember this match ever occurred and mm -hmm. it was rated considerable it's like but like we we looked it up for the sake of an argument and a, and a debate but it's like who cares <laughs> like anarchy rules was 98 maybe 99 at 99 and it was the first pay-per-view that was uh carried in canada um but it's like it was 24 years ago people still mention that match to me and at the time we opened the show in chicago the place went absolutely batshit crazy we got a standing ovation mid-match it's like we got him yeah and neither one of us got hurt and we had a hell of a lot of fun and i've even mentioned this to dave once i was talking to him about it and I don't know where the hell I would have been at because I, my, my brain, we actually spoke about it, not just DM'd, but yeah. um, my match with Terry Funk, which is probably my favorite. I've had several, but the one I worked Terry Funk in his hometown of Amarillo, Texas. I dropped the Canadian US title to him on a host show in WCW. It was perfect. The, as much as Americans love America, Texans love Texas and Amarillo Ites, yeah. whatever they might be called, love Terry Funk. He was a god and they hated me. And literally everything we did, if I touched him, I had just committed the gravest sin in the history of the world. And if he touched me, it was New Year's Eve and the ball just dropped. Like the crowd reaction was insane. And when he won, the place went nuts the baby faces that came out to raise Terry on his shoulders afterwards, thanked us both for letting us be a part of that emotion. Mm. And like I told Dave, I've got it on DVD. Uh, 
uh, Charles Robinson recorded it, gave it to me in VHS. I've since converted it to D- a DVD. But it's like in that moment that night, I told Dave, it's 10 stars. It's perfect. Hmm. I said, but you go back and watch. It's probably like two and three quarters. Who knows? You know what I mean? It's like, sure. because wrestling's about the moment. Yeah. And in that moment, there is no way we could have hooked the people bigger mm. at all. Mm. But if you're going to sit down and watch a match from 2000 today in your living room without the angle, the story, and the mood of the building, who knows what it is? Mm. Is this one of the big pieces of advice that you're giving to wrestlers uh, in your role now in Impact Wrestling? Is it about creating that moment? Not that moment so much, but quite literally in quotes, I use the, you need to create moments. Mm. And it, it's that there needs to be, if you're a baby face, if you're a heel, there needs to be a moment where you do something as a baby face that makes the crowd excited and happy. And you need to be in a position where we can see your face and you look as happy as we feel so that we can connect in that moment and associate that joy with your face. And similarly, as a heel, there needs to be a moment where you make us mad, where we are unhappy, pissed off, angry, whatever you want to say, and we see you and associate that with you. And also, too, matching the energy in that moment that if the crowd energy drops, you as a heel need to represent that. You can't be moving around quickly because then the energy doesn't match. That's where the old school baby face fire came from. Mm. It's what an end zone dance is all about. Mm. You score that touchdown. The crowd's doing this. Well, if you're just standing there like a dork, you're not in the party with us. Mm. But if you're spiking that football and you're doing your icky shuffle or whatever other uh, dated reference I can throw out there, (laughs) <laughs> where you look as excited then we connect mm. we're at the same party we're both drunk we're having fun we associate that with you mm. where if you are just constantly doing your spots and never have that moment where we can celebrate with you that points have been scored that ball has been spiked then it's just that we enjoy the match and it's not you mm. and that's where you get over and then on top of that, it's something that Jim Ross taught me in 1994 in Smoky Mountain. In that moment where you stop doing all of your action and stuff, it gives the announcers and the commentators a chance to actually put you over. Because mm. Jim Ross pulled me aside one of the first matches he called for me in Smoky Mountain. And he says, just so you know, kid, he says, unless you actually stop doing something long enough, I can't ever talk about you and put you over. And again, he, he did it in a funny, very honest way, but just sort of like, I kind of carry a lot of credibility here. Let me put you over kid. And mm. it really drove it in my head. Cause he says, if you just keep wrestling, I'm going to be saying, Oh, drop kick, touchdown, arm drag. He says, if you stop for a second, I can tell people how great you are and get you over. Wow. And I'm like, thank you, sir. I'm going to do that. <laughs> and you realize that there needs to be those moments where the audience can connect to you. And if it's on television, that the announcers can do something other than stating the names of all the moves you're doing and let people actually know who you are as a person so they can connect to you. Yeah. I know how much like Smoky Mountain meant to you and how important it was to your career to become the performer that you were. That's something you learned from Jim Ross there. What's something you learned from Jim Cornette when you were there? The biggest thing I learned from Jim Cornette was you're not doing the wrestling. And this is probably again, dating me because it's not necessarily done this way anymore. You're wrestling the match for the audience, not yourself. Don't do the match. You want do the match that the audience wants, Mm -hmm. because when Jericho and I went to Smokey, we're watching new Japan junior heavyweight matches in, you know, 1993 And we're trying to be cutting edge and doing all these fancy moves and shit. And then we're in Hazard, Kentucky. And the audience is looking at going, what the hell are these kids doing? And it's like, we had to slow it down. And Jim was the one that drove it home that I know you guys want to be going 55. No one in this town has ever drove over 35 in their life. Maybe start at 40. 
Mm. You've got to bring them into the decade before you try to bring them completely up to speed. And I learned that it is your audience. It's like, you're the performer. You're not doing the match for you. You didn't buy the ticket. Yeah. And that's where I really started realizing that, okay, what does this building want? What do these people want? And working to them. Yeah. As you know, Jim Cornette's so polarizing, especially now. And you, you love him or you hate him. There's really no in between. I would say there's a lot of people that are both, but yes. <laughs> Maybe they love to hate him. No, but it's I, nice I to think hear something positive. But I think there's people that love what he did in his career and his knowledge of history. And they also hate where he's gone with his podcast and his digging in and his takes on much of current wrestling, mm. uh, which are very easy to hate. You know, the, the rant he cut on Becky Lynch for getting pregnant was just like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? It's like, let the woman have a yeah. kid if she wants to have a kid. It's like, yeah, it's almost like he's playing up like a, a heel version of himself, you know, on the podcast. I think many podcasters get into that. Yeah. Um, and politicians. I should turn heel on you politicians, right now. Like... No, but there's that. I must develop a following. And actually, yeah. he's following the advice he gave me to a certain extent. True. He's found an audience that wants to hear this. And he is delivering that to his audience. Mm. And um, there are those. And I don't know if it's a defense of him. I know I've used it before, but I think the wrestling business is so important to Jim that it's like his kid. And when he saw Kenny Omega wrestle a blow up doll, a nine year old girl, that was such an atrocity against his child mm -hmm. that it can never be forgiven. Mm. So no matter what Kenny Omega ever does, he could solve world hunger. He could, you know, be the greatest human being on the planet, do the greatest matches of even Jim Cornette style. There is that sin that was committed against Jim Cornette's child when he was in DDT that must never be forgiven. And he's just dug in for that. And yeah. he just seems to refuse to acknowledge that anything he's done after that point has any value whatsoever, despite mounds and mounds of evidence to the contrary. Yeah. And now there's a whole group of fans that will just always know Kenny Omega as Twinkle Toes. Yes. There's a, there's, a, there's an additional part to that, but we will leave that out. <laughs> but the thing too, like I'm, I'm appalled as much as anyone when I see people wrestling eight-year-old girls blow up dolls in particular but if i was in year two of my wrestling career year five of my wrestling career and the only booking i got was this company in japan and i'm in japan working and other people on the show are doing these matches and then i'm told your turn even as much as i would hate it i don't know if i'd quit my job over it yeah and I think that's something that like, I, I've never talked to Kenny about it. I know him, but not well. Obviously we both have Don as a mutual friend. So we, there's an association there, but it's like, I don't even know whether he was particularly happy with doing it, mm -hmm. but that's what DDT was. And to a certain extent still is. And yeah. it's not something I would like to do, but I don't know if I would have been man enough to not. Right. Right. Lance, this has been a like an absolute masterclass. I feel like uh, there's going to be a lot of people who want to get into pro wrestling that are going to be listening to this several times because I think you've given us so many great nuggets here. I just have a few more questions as we wrap this up. Do you think the, the Storm Wrestling Academy will ever be reopened? Maybe you have a little bit more time on your hands right now? Uh, I don't see it happening. There, It was such a giant task of getting it started getting insurance is a gigantic hurdle, even just getting a ring, getting it. It was a lot of work. And I don't know if I have the desire to do that much work again. And I stopped doing it primarily because I'm a hands-on teacher. I took literally every time we taught moves, I was pretty much taking them from all the students first. Wow. From a safety standpoint too, because I'm really good at protecting myself. So 
all right, we're doing DDTs today. I'm going to make sure you're doing it right. DDT me first. Okay, we're doing suplexes. Suplex me first. If you don't hurt me and I feel like you're competent, you can give it to the rest of the students. And I had matches with every single student but one. Um, he was someone who kept showing up late. And his last day, which was his turn to have a match, he showed up late and didn't get his match. But I had a match with every student. And it just started taking its physical toll it was probably more abuse than having a wrestling career was mm. and i was just no i'm done um i in, really enjoy the producer teaching aspect of it uh so i suspect i will stay with impact for a uh, an extended period of time because i love the atmosphere and the talent there and very much enjoy the schedule um, who are some can, of your uh who are some of your students that came through that you're especially proud of what they've accomplished? Well, this is a weird thing with me. Um, I don't like the word and I don't like saying I'm proud of people. Okay. Because I feel then I'm taking their credit. Mm, okay. You should be proud of your own accomplishments. But if I go, I'm proud that Taya Valkyrie has succeeded so much in her career. I'm boasting my chest that I did a good job. It's like, no, she did a good job. She fought like crazy and paid her dues and fought like crazy and dealt with stuff and succeeded. I'm extremely happy for her. I have a tremendous amount of respect for her, but I think pride as a word is mm. hers. And there's, there's many of them, you know, the um, Chelsea green right now is having a hell of a run and really found herself. And I'm, tremendously happy for but i always sort of it gets stuck in my throat to say the word proud mm. and i think the only times i've used it i've had people when you know when emma got signed when chelsea got signed when tyler breeze got signed when you know uh peyton hoist i always say hoist it was royce for them but my uh fandom of uh, hicks and gracie and hoist gracie comes out <laughs> When they got signed, they're like, oh, you must be really proud now that they're signed. And I'm like, I was proud of them day one. Mm. Because they worked harder after my school and succeeded, I don't think I should feel better about myself for that. So I always think saying I'm proud of you is in some way taking credit. Mm. And I don't like that. And I've noticed it. There will be people that, hey, I'm so proud of you, brother. And I'm like, there is no connection to his success to you. Why are you proud? And I just think it feels like you're taking credit you don't deserve. So I avoid using that term, but I'm very happy for so many of them that have had success. And I, I've had that too, uh, in that, and it's, it's a different era again, a difference between when I broke in and now. Like it blows my mind when people congratulate people for winning a pro wrestling match. Because in my era, you would be labeled a mark if you acted like the win mattered to you. Mm. And I remember when I won the ECW tag titles with Candido, we come back through the curtain, everybody was congratulating us. And when Chris and I got by ourselves by our chairs and sat down, I'm like, I said to him, like, they're ribbing, right? And he's like, no, they really mean it. I'm like, we didn't really win. And it's like, well, yeah, but they think it means something. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so when my students or friends achieve different levels and you will see everyone congratulating them, I never do. Mm. And I have sent DMs to people. I remember um, Drew when he won the world title at Mania, uh, the pandemic years, because I'd worked with Drew as, as my brief run before the pandemic as a producer. Yeah. And a big fan of the guy. And I was really happy for him. And I, I sent him a text or a DM. I don't remember which. And I just said to him, it's like, I refuse to congratulate people on winning professional wrestling matches, but I am very happy for you. It's really nice when the good people win. And it's like, and by that, I wasn't even meaning win the match. It was just win in life. It's like, yeah. you know, he achieved that level and i was happy for him but i can't and just to clarify i do believe in many instances not all 
there is an accomplishment with being reaching that top level and being the world champion, especially if you're actually the figurehead of the promotion. But even to me then, I wouldn't wait until the one, two, three to congratulate them. Like once the decision is made that Adam Copeland has achieved the level of success, we can main event with this guy. We're going to put the world title on him and have him as our top guy. Well, that's when the congratulations are due. Mm. We don't need to wait until he gets his hand raised and walks back with the trophy. Mm. Because again, I was taught in a different era where it's a work brother. <laughs> and that was sort of my, my, my mentality. When I came back from the match with Chris Candido, it's like, everyone's congratulating him and I, and I'm like, we're the same, like Phil and Doug and balls and Axel also busted their ass. It's like, why are you congratulating us? The six of us worked together to have this match. It's just the outcome was decided ahead of time that we would be the ones winning. We haven't accomplished anything after the match that we hadn't accomplished before the match. Mm. And it just, it just didn't sit well in my head. So I always, when there's those that I feel like deserve the pat on the back, cause I know they're happy. They have achieved a championship. I always preface with the, I will not give congratulations, but I am very happy for your success. That is such a great perspective. I feel like moving forward, I'm going to be thinking about that every time I type out congratulations. No, 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 backspace, backspace. Uh, uh, Lance, this has been such a great conversation. This is everything I would, I hoped it would have been and more. And uh, I can't wait to talk to you again, maybe sometime in person next time. But I end every conversation with the same question because gratitude is such a, a big part of my life. I wake up every day, I say out loud three things I'm grateful for. And I do it before I go to sleep too. What's three things in your life that you're grateful for right now? Um, I think my family has to be first. It always was my priority over my career. I have two kids and a wife that I love dearly and are a big part of my life now. And then I think the the other two things, like my career as a whole, but I like Chris Jericho, the debt of gratitude, I owe that man, not just from making me stay in Calgary and not quit that first day, but for the constant support and assistance throughout my career. Um, I, I just don't think it's possible I could have gotten through those first five years without him. Mm. And then I think there's always because I always when you who who you really want to think, but uh, Fit Finley, I worked with him in Europe as a wrestler and stole a lot of stuff from him, but him just his professionalism and his a business the uh, the the job of pro wrestling above all else that he always put the business ahead of himself and that level of professionalism. I both appreciated being around, but also just what it taught me and, and uh, helped make me the man I am. I, those would be my go-tos, my family, most important. And then my career would not have happened without Jericho. And I don't think I'd have been uh, the performer I am and the man I am without uh, crossing paths with Fit Finley. Well, again, sir, thank you so much for this great conversation. Thank you for making the time to do this too. Oh, no problem. I'm, I'm semi-retired. My impact schedule makes things fairly easy. And the, the Laurier tie-in was an easy sell when they approached me with uh, doing this interview. That's I, Although again, the, the guy who pitched it was incorrect in that he had uh, pitched to Lou that we went to the same high school. Yeah. I, 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 I was like, no, Derek, we got this wrong. It was the same college, the same university. Yeah. Cause I'm like, really? And so I, I looked up who you were and it's like, Laurie, I'm like, okay, they just got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Lance, thank you again. Oh, my pleasure.